Uh, to my far right is Feral Lassie from the Solomon Islands. He was here last year. He is back because he sees value. And they are changing the way they're thinking their long-line fisheries. Next to Feral, there is Dr. Salome Tolfa from Tonga in the University of the South Pacific, who set up a new Pacific catalyst to foster innovation and build skills of our people across our region. Um, here in the beautiful coloured shirt is Ben Panea, Ben Panea from the Cook Islands, who has led fisheries there for many years and also in the region and is now the Chief of Staff for the Prime Minister's Office. That's how important these issues are. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we will move to the panel. And Grima, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, is this working? Can you hear me? Okay, then uh, as my co-chair, let me introduce myself first. My name is Grimur Valdemarsson, an Icelander. I have uh, worked in fisheries uh, all my career. First here in Iceland at the fisheries laboratories as a microbiologist and then as a director of uh, one of the, in, of the industries division of the FAO in Rome, Italy for 13 years, now retired. Well. Before I introduce the Icelandic, uh, Icelandic part of the panel, let me say that um, the last few days have been quite remarkable for me because once more uh, there is a spirit of island mentality that uh, always emerges when islanders meet and they have many things in common. So I want to begin by summarizing the four factors that I think are really uh, a common thread to our fisheries. Well, first, we need to ensure coastal state rights, particularly in shared fisheries. I think that's very important. And number two, uh, which is evident to many, that the economies of islanders are very reliant on fisheries for development. Certainly for Iceland for many, many decades and also for the Pacific island states, even though this is changing now for Iceland. The third I want to mention is the challenges in management of the surrounding high seas. That is probably becoming one of the uh, most difficult riddles in, in fisheries management and governance. And fourth, the issue so much discussed at this uh, conference, which is the increasing impact of climate change, and we have heard a lot of the examples of how that is affecting fisheries and what can be done about it. So, the Icelandic panelists, first of all, I would like to mention, mention Guðmundur Kristjánsson, who is uh, uh, CEO of HP Grandi, one of the largest fishing companies in Iceland, and we had the privilege of visiting your factory here in, in Reykjavik, and one of the new beautiful vessels uh, that we saw yesterday sail out of the harbor was absolutely uh, fantastic. Second, Guðmundur Fertram Kristjánsson, CEO of Keresis, uh, a company that is really breaking ground with new products made from cod skin to heal wounds, and we had the privilege of visiting uh, him. And um, thirdly, Dr. Freitis Vigfusdóttir, research specialist and marine biologist of the University of Iceland. So welcome. So then the first question. I will start asking our Pacific uh, representatives to respond to the question that after these days here, what are the main challenges and opportunities you see that could stem from our future collaboration? Who would like to start? I have another set for the Icelanders then. Afterwards, please. Kiran, I'll be pleased to try and address that question, but firstly speak to the issue which Peter also raised, and that's the very interesting friendship that is developing between the island states of the Arctic and the Pacific. And, um, I know the relationship between my Prime Minister and President Grimson has also been um, one of the factors that has brought us together, and it's quite interesting to see the dynamics. Um, we are, in some sense, metaphorically speaking, like a global experiment, aren't we? 
both island states separated across the globe, um, subject to high levels of climate change radiation, if you will. And so what's been really interesting for me is seeing our flight response. We're determined to survive. And when doing so, we're going to ensure fisheries is sustainable. I will speak on uh, behalf of uh, my country, Solomon Islands. So um, I was a participant to, to this exchange program last year. So when, when I was invited and part of the uh, exchange program, we, we visited uh, the, um, the establishment, uh, fisheries uh, industry uh, here in uh, Iceland. So, um, what, what I've uh, found, found out from the exchange is that um, the, the level of innovation in which brought uh, Iceland to, to, the, to one of the leading, or if not the leading uh, fisheries countries in the world, is true innovation, um, processing, and the state of the art and machineries that are used in the industry. Um, now, that, that's the observation. Now, what, what are the elements that contributed to this? Well, there are a number of elements. Uh, but one of the key is the ownership, taking ownership of the fisheries. In our country, we have fisheries, uh, tuna fisheries, we, we, which can be classified uh, basically into two, two broad categories. The, tuna industrial fisheries, long line fisheries, and pursuing fisheries. Now, so in terms of the lo long line fisheries, kind of uh, localized, something that we have the capability, we have the capability to, to localize it, but we didn't do that. So that coming here, that is one of the lessons that I learned, that we need to localize our um, um, uh, long line fisheries. Something that has a value of 100 million per year, but we are getting only six to seven million, there definitely needs to be a change in the model. And we think there's something that we need, we, we have a lesson to draw from, from Iceland. And it is something that we are working on creating arrangement to, to help us to, to change our model. Yeah, to change our model. So we, uh, during our uh, consultation last year and also part of uh, this week, early, earlier this week, we, we are making some progress towards that, and we, are, and we still look forward. We are continuing to work on creating this arrangement to change our model. So this is something that suddenly, and something that we are very appreciative for part of, uh, uh, taking part of this exchange program. Thank you. Thank you. Salam. Thank you. Um, as, as you've heard from, our, from the previous uh, speakers, they mentioned uh, the, some of the challenges that we face. And uh, we are surrounded by, by ocean. Most of our coastal communities are located in the coastal areas. And while large countries, large developed industrialized countries are trying to reduce your carbon emission, we on a daily basis were battling the, the impacts of climate change with uh, stronger cyclones, more frequent cyclones, with uh, heavy rains that are uh, causing lots of floods, which is happening currently in uh, some of the uh, islands uh, at the moment. Um, we, we, um, we are optimistic that with the rising sea level, we believe we would still be here in the next 50 to 100 years. And with that idea, we decided to um, formed this consortium called the Pacific Catalyst to try and create a think tank so we can think forward of what we're going to do to help our people, not just in managing our marine resources, but also in trying to improve the value, the economic values that we can derive from the use of our resources. And with that, we realized that we lack the capacity in the region to try and uh, create this um, innovative thinking. And coming to Iceland has been a, um, an eye-opening experience and learning how 
Um, the fisheries in, in Iceland has been very innovative, how it has, um, uh, for example, looking at the using and uh, minimizing the waste and using all the, 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 all the fish, the whole cod, you know, not just the meat, you look at the, the skin, um, even the bones, the heads. And that's the kind of thinking we want to bring to our Pacific region. And so with this, um, we're hoping that with the partnership with Iceland, we're hoping we can uh, um, help in building that capacity in our region so that we can get our people to think ahead where we want our fisheries to be in the next 20 to 50 years from now um, through research and uh, through uh, carrying out various uh, analysis. But that is one of the things that we're hoping to get out of this, this partnership so we can broaden that and uh, learn from the experiences, from the good experiences that you have here in your, in your country. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I want to turn to uh, the Icelandic members of the panel and basically ask them uh, sort of what could we contribute. Well, obviously, from all that we saw in technology with companies like Marel and Kersis and uh, HP Grande, it's obvious that uh, it is a lot from sort of cutting fillets, uh, uh, having surveillance on ships, and it was quite amazing to see one company in Iceland that Laugavegur having on their screens real-time uh, surveillance of ships in their area, uh, according to a contract. The possibilities of surveillance are, are, are huge. But, for example, you mentioned that even though you have been working on, on, uh, on uh, cod skin, there might be, be others. Or maybe I should put the, the, the question a bit more general. What could we contribute? Could we contribute, for example, in the process of innovation? Because it's often so difficult to take a certain technology and just move it over. Exactly. It's a good question. So I think uh, it's all based on profitability. To, to create innovation, uh, there needs to be a profitability in the fishing industry. And I think the Pacific nations, they are very fortunate that uh, there is still a lot of fish in the ocean. So I think uh, there's a lot of fish being fished and there is not much focus on quality or prices. Um, in the 80s in Iceland, we actually experienced that uh, suddenly there wasn't enough fish in the ocean. And uh, there has been a, a lot of turbulence since then in how to manage our fisheries. And we have been very fortunate in creating a system that is both sustainable and creates a lot of profitability. And when you have the sustainability and the profitability, uh, the fish processors, they will start to invest in innovation and new technologies. And quota system, transferable quotas, um, uh, actually quotas instead of fishing days, uh, fish markets, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, aspects like that. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something that is left to be implemented in the Pacific nations. Um, and uh, I guess probably people will, be people will be forced to do so when the fishing stocks uh, start to go down. And then actually uh, it might be a big benefit to look to the turbulence and the discussion that was to taken here in Iceland over 10 or 20 years and learn from that. But in terms of your question about how an innovation, so we are actually in Keresis, we have actually identified uh, that, uh, that the regeneration with fish tissue is amazingly powerful. We all know that transplants are powerful. We can take organs from a person and, and put into another person and that person will heal. Um, and we've actually discovered that although there are 400 years between humans and fish, we can do the same with the components of fish in humans. We are doing that now with, with fish skin for chronic wounds. We are going to do that also for, for dura replacement, for, for hernia repair, uh, for, for breast reconstruction, ligament repair, and even later down the road with organ, organ uh, repair. And uh, we are very excited to, to work with tuna and, and, and see, see what the Pacific species have to offer. That's very clear. Now, uh, over to Guðmundur. Uh, it was fascinating to see your processing plant and your vessel, 
And uh, what I, th I think what drew most attention was the new revolutionary super chilling system, cooling the fish uh, better without ice, etc. So the question is what could the technology you, uh, you have at your fingertips, what could it do down there? Yes, um, <coughs> thank you, and thank you to, for to be here. And <coughs> before I start to answer that, I, I, I was listening to my colleagues here, and uh, what we can um, distribute or tell you wh why we have been successful. Uh, history repeats itself, and uh, what it, this has not been easy in Iceland, because you said in 20 to next 50 years in, in your islands, <coughs> uh, what we did is that uh, we took a fight, for instance, with the British and the English. We had a war for our, 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 our waters. And then we were very lucky. We had the very good lawyers who were participating in the law of the sea, the Uncolas. And um, we built our fishery management on international law on Uncolas. And what we focus on is that we must listen to science because we cannot overfish. We must have a, a, a ITQ so the industry can make a profit. And also, we focus a lot on education. And uh, we have very good schools. We try to educate all our people. And what you are seeing today, if I come to your question now, is that you are seeing what we have been, what we see that 50 years ago. But this has not been easy, and the super cooling is one of our products we've been develop developing for many, many years with our technical people around the industry, and we have invested in it. And uh, the reason we could invest is that there was a decision taken here 30 years ago that the industry should be profitable and also transparent. And we decided to have a one database for the total industry, which is um, uh, the fisheries, um, how can I, fish store, what is it in English? Okay. <laughs> Fishery director, yes. They were not all the time popular, but they are necessary. So we must follow all the law, what we decide on. And uh, every five, ten years, we had to take a crazy battle with uh, new politicians because they have forgot the hist history. So for you, uh, if we can contribute to you, is that um, you must focus on your infrastructure. Then, People will come, your local people, you will get foreign people. But there must be a trust, and, uh, because you're talking about your, like these slides we are looking here, is that uh, if there is a climate change, what do we do if the, our species goes away and the, another species come in? And we don't have a historical right to fish it. But it's said in the Uncolas, the law of the sea, that the coastal state has a right. But we need to negotiate with others. So. Uh, uh, what uh, we could do, you could, you could learn from us, but you must take the last 50 years what we've been doing. I think that was a very important message, indeed. So, the last panelist to address the question, Ritish. Yeah, so, um, what I feel that we've learned from since last year and this year, and we're getting a little bit more focused this year on, um, there are these long-term goals, and we talk a lot about what you, we can teach you or you can learn and you can teach us about is uh, in management and policy, in innovation, in processing and technology, and uh, the continuous value chain to have control of taking the fish from the sea and where it goes to a market. So these are really the three pillars of uh, a good run fishing industry. However, the basis of this is science and education. And uh, Gurmit, you topped on into this and um, that we have good education of our people in the scientific um, arena in Iceland and in the fishing industry as well. And I believe that this is a very tangible outcome and a short-term goal where we can truly reach uh, and we can start talking about it already today and already implement something next year. And um, Iceland and possibly in partnership with the um, University in the South Pacific, we can put up an exchange system in education 
of the fishing industry as well as marine sciences. And this is both through University of Iceland, we offer numerous courses, a master's program in fishing management and business, um, UNU program in the fishing training school, etc. So I believe that this is a very tangible outcome that is worth looking at. Thank you very much for that, the greatest. Isn't it time to wrap up? Over to you. <laughs> thank you, my dear friend. Um, and Thredas, thank you for that because it ends on a great point. It's not just about the fish, it's about the people. And uh, you've heard from the people of, of the Arctic and the people of the Pacific, and you might have wondered why there's two empty chairs here. And there's one last message that we want to turn and give to you, particularly all the governments, NGOs, scientists, and people of the Arctic. This empty chair is, represents the high seas of the Pacific Islands region. This empty chair represents the amazing treaty we just found out about that the, island, that the nations of your region, together with nations that are very common in our region to come and fish, like Japan, Korea, China, the United States, that for the first time under uh, the law of the sea, the Arctic has created a treaty because of climate change under a framework that was created when no one talked about climate change. We are very excited to learn from all of you as part of this partnership as well, because we would like to fill this seat. With that, I would like to thank my fellow panelists, my organizers. There is the ongoing voyage here of an exciting partnership for 21st century uh, fisheries and ocean management. To use more of the fish, to catch less, use more, waste not, want not, it's island style, island scale, and I believe will also be come the way of this planet. Faftai Tali Lava, thank you very, very much. <laughs>